Great. Thank you. Um, my name is Konrad Szymaszko. I work for Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights, uh, a human rights NGO based in Warsaw, and uh, I'm very grateful that you decided to join the webinar this afternoon or even spend more time uh, with us with two or even three webinars. I'm going to present Siena draft recommendations on enhancing the legal frameworks for human enhancement technologies. Um, the discussion paper and this presentation is just a part of uh, Siena project and it builds upon the previous analyzers conducted within the project, particularly the analyzers of the legal and uh, human rights uh, requirements for human enhancement technologies. Uh, where we conducted literature review and analyzed relevant regulation at the international level, EU level, and national levels in selected countries, but also upon the uh, state of our review of human enhancement technologies, ethical analysis of human enhancement technologies, and on preliminary proposals for an ethical framework. All the reports I mentioned uh, are available or will be soon available at the project website. Uh, um, and encourage you to, to, to see them uh, for you. And based on these results, I'll be presenting a, a draft outline of some of the potential changes in the existing frameworks that might be needed or desirable to reinforce Siena ethical proposals in the human enhancement field. Uh, what I'll be presenting is a, still a draft outline and the main purpose of this presentation and um, this, the discussion paper is to collect your comments and suggestions. So we are really looking forward to the discussion. Uh, following the consultations, uh, the report will be developed further and finalized uh, in July. Uh, the report will be later available on the Siena website. And of course, I'll be very happy to, to share it with you also before. In Siena, human enhancement has been defined as a modification aimed at improving human performance and brought about by science-based and or technology-based interventions in or on the human body. Um, this presentation and discussion paper does not cover issues related to a genetic enhancement, as these questions are addressed separately in a parallel report on human genomics. We will focus uh, especially on the EU legal framework with some references to the international and national level. Um, and in order to develop the most useful recommendations, we'll attempt to focus on the existing uh, human enhancement technologies and their developments that are plausible in the near future. We're trying to avoid what have been described as a uh, multifactorial speculations about uh, potential scenarios about the distant future human enhancement technologies. Among the existing and emerging human enhancement technologies, we pay particular attention to areas where potential uh, regulatory gaps or gray zones have been identified in Siena research. For that reason, I refer more to human enhancement devices, such as um, neuromodulatory devices, brain computer interfaces, system implants, and procedures such as body modifications, procedures, and less to uh, pharmaceuticals. Though pharmaceuticals drugs are also already in the use, mostly of label, and there's there the interest in cognitive uh, enhancing drugs. Enhancement drugs are in general currently strictly regulated by the international drug control regime and the national laws following it. Although this regime has been heavily criticized and there has been some interesting proposals of alternative or supplementary regulatory modes, this remains a heavily disputed debate and we will focus more on less regulated areas. Improving legal frameworks is never an easy task, but there's a number of specific challenges that make it particularly difficult in the context of human enhancement technologies. First, the definition of human enhancement remains a highly debated issue, with recurring challenges of drawing distinction between common and highly problematic demarcations, such as treatment versus enhancement, therapeutic, non-therapeutic, medical, non-medical. And these are not just theoretical disputes, but they make it difficult to define the field of potential legal intervention. This challenge must be partially addressed by focusing on more core types of human enhancement, while acknowledging that uh, more shadow areas will remain. Secondly, human enhancement does not refer to a specific technology or application, but rather to a very diversified and wide field of procedures and goods 
that share certain types of purpose. For the reasons of this diversity, it is not necessarily advisable to adopt a high level or general policy towards the whole field, such as general prehensman approach or general restrictive approach, but it might be more reasonable to take a systemic case-by-case -case approach with due consideration of both benefits and risks that, might entail, uh, that they may entail for important societal values. Here, of course, I'm following the, the approach uh, from the 2009 STAR study that has presented the five general policy options, including this systemic case-by-case -case approach. Thirdly, human enhancement remains a highly controversial topic in the sense that both academic literature and general public is deeply divided on many moral issues regarding it. So there's no common stance uh, with regard to many questions even on, uh, on a high level, what contrasts, for example, with AI fields, which where there are very uh, heated disputes on many issues, but uh, general guidelines that have been adopted recently show some uh, convergence, at least on a very general level. We've got, in case of human enhancement, many of its issues still await further democratic deliberation, and acknowledging this, uh, recommendations at this stage do not, in every case, have to provide uh, definite legal solutions, we think, but may rather indicate areas of needed changes and possible directions. In the next slides, I'm going to present uh, four of such very broad areas based on the results of the Siena previous uh, ethical research that identified a number of general societal values that are among the most likely to be affected uh, by human enhancement technologies, which include, uh, among others, health and safety, privacy and data protection, autonomy and equality. Broadly speaking, safety concerns may be addressed by product safety regulation that is aimed at ensuring that products placed on the market meet adequate safety requirements and uh, by regulating how these technologies are used in practice. First, I'd like to discuss shortly the product safety issues. Currently, under the EU label framework, many devices marketed for enhancement purposes have to meet only basic product safety requirements, even if te technically they are the same products that uh, when marketed for medical purposes, must undergo a rigorous pre-market assessment. With adoption of the new EU medical device regulation, this situation will change as a legal regime applicable to medical devices will be extended to a close list group of devices that are marketed for non-medical non purposes. This change responds to a number of important calls for such an extension. However, the current version of the list is limited only to seven type of devices and there's a question of course whether it includes all relevant uh, types that, that entail risk, similar risks to medical devices and whether uh, the European Commission that, that is powered to amend the list will, will manage to, to uh, keep the list updated taking into account the expanding market of some devices and, and fast pace of, of technolog technological developments. In the context of product safety, it's also important to notice that uh, human enhancement technologies poses, uh, pose safety challenges that go beyond purely physical risk, like mechanical risk or electrical risk, risks. For instance, brain-computer interfaces systems or ICT implants may entail uh, cyber security threats. Moreover, some human enhancement technologies may also have adverse impacts on mental health, uh, for instance, in the case of use of chip implants for employees, as they can generate feeling of being constantly monitored and for increase the levels of stress and anxiety. Uh, in general, the current EU product safety framework to a certain level recognizes the extended cost concept of safety, but on a close examination, uh, there are some potential loopholes that need to be studied closer and uh, beyond EU framework, also uh, other cyber criminal, for example, frameworks on the Council of Europe level, national level. It needs to be studied closer whether, to what extent the current framework address uh, specifics of human enhancement technologies in the context of this extended uh, safety. For instance, uh, whether they address appropriately the fact that many human enhancement devices may be connected to human body or generate some additional risks, cybersecurity risks. When it comes to uh, health and safety of procedures, 
regulations relevant for this um, the procedures I mean both uh, body modification surgeries but also uh, just practic practice of the use of enhancement devices uh, reg regulations relevant for this area can be primarily found on the national level and as the Siena previous research found out uh, the regulatory landscape in the sphere is is a bit diversified and uh, there's some risk of gray zones where it's unclear what standards of occur uh, apply in this given case. Uh, this challenge has become increasingly important as there's a growing market uh, of consumer enhancement devices and some of these technologies do not incur serious safety risks when they're used under adequate supervision, but uh, they may bring significant threats to health if uh, they're self-administrated in a wrong way or, or perhaps uh, provided by service provider who lacks necessary training. So there have been a need for improvement in the area of measures aimed at uh, safety of procedures, which could allow, which could include uh, the following measures among many others. For example, allowing that at least uh, some of the human enhancement services uh, to be carried only by authorized, per authorized persons with appropriate training, or imposing obligation on persons carrying out the human enhancement procedures to perform them in a technically correct way according to professional standards and safe requirements or introducing minimum age requirements for participating in such procedures. And of course, uh, there are others. There's a need for further analyze to determine whether regulating uh, human health and procedures could lie within the EU competences. One could argue that this patchwork national protection may affect smooth functioning of the internal market and that may call for harmonized action, but um, one could also argue that new powers are very limited in this sphere, as the organization and delivery of health services remain uh, within the competences of the member states. So perhaps more likely these issues could be addressed on the national level and additionally on the international level uh, beyond the EU. Uh, Council of Europe Convention of on human rights and biomedicine, the Oviedo Convention, could be of particular importance here as it is the only um, international legally binding instrument uh, on the protection of human rights in the biomedical field. And uh, it may require further clarification whether the Oviedo Convention provisions relevant for safety of procedures also cover non-therapeutic interventions. Um, this, this, this guidance could be perhaps issued uh, through more soft law instruments like Committee of Ministers' recommendations or even by an additional protocol. Another issue that is often discussed uh, is, is data, data protection and privacy, as many human enhancement technologies um, process personal data. And uh, what is especially has been recognized as, as uh, interesting as, as, as potentially uh, entailing risks is that they may often process uh, information on brain activity. This, this brain data or neurodata uh, has particular led to questions whether the existing European privacy and data protection frameworks remain well suited to address uh, challenges of certain human enhancement technologies. Brain data is not explicitly um, included in the exhaustive list of, of uh, sensitive data uh, it is also not clear whether they could also always qualify as belonging to the other categories of uh, sensitive data when used for enhancement purposes. Uh, and it has also been argued that brain data may be regarded as more sensitive uh, than sensitive data under the current data protection law, that perhaps the data protection framework is not constructed to deal with such a level of intimacy, and hence another approach need to be considered. Uh, more connected to privacy, uh, perhaps in such concepts, concepts as mental privacy. Thus, uh, the European data protection should be reviewed to assess whether it is in its current form suitable to adequately protect the brain data in the context of human enhancement. If the answer is negative, it should be examined whether it could be amended, for instance, by adding brain data to the list of sensitive data, uh, similar to genetic data, for example or whether uh, another legal framework is needed to address privacy risks it incurs. And there are some interesting developments uh, in this regard on the uh, Council of Europe level and OECD, so they could also inform the EU further steps in this area. 
The fourth broad area got, uh, is connected to autonomy, where principle of informed consent uh, is of special importance. A person are going to have some procedures should obtain clear and accurate information about the expected benefits and, and risks of such a procedure. Here again, uh, previous analysis has shown that, uh, that this area differs from country to country, and rather, in case of some applications, such as direct-to-consumer neurotechnologies, this may be very unclear at this moment. Um, and as noted, whether the EU has competences to regulate in this area uh, requires further analysis in the view of principles of proportionality and subsidiarity. It could be argued that this matter is touched upon organisation delivery of health services, which may be members has competences. On the other hand, again, there are the uh, market, internal market concerns connected to divergent national laws. And these could perhaps in the future uh, serve as a basis to consider introducing a requirement to provide uh, relevant information, at least with regard to some of the devices that may be more risky. Uh, and perhaps uh, the, the, rec the information requirement, the counseling requirement introduced recently in the EU in vitro medical device regulation of connected to genetic testing could, uh, could serve as an example, although it has to be noted that it was introduced following a heated debate on the proportionality and subsidiarity in this area. Uh, again, most, more probably this could be addressed on the national level or uh, again on the uh, Council of Europe probably, or the Convention. At this moment, uh, when it comes to informed consent, refers to intervention in the health field, which is ambiguous. Uh, when it comes to uh, enhancement interventions, this could be um, improved with, with further guidance by additional protocol or, or, or other software instruments connected to, uh, to the system. And uh, making informed choices about participating in enhancement procedure can be also adversely affected by misleading advertising uh, that uh, either trivializes risks or makes um, false overblown claims about benefits of, of such enhancement procedures or goods. At this moment, misleading commercial practices is already prohibited under the uh, EU framework, but it has been reported that misleading marketing of some existing human enhancement technologies uh, does occur in the EU member states. So um, there's a need to examine whether this is a result from the, the results from the lack of enforcement of the existing framework, or uh, there's a regulatory gap and uh, perhaps uh, there's a need for a more tailored response when it comes to misleading advertising of the human enhancement devices. And the final of the, of the this large areas is, is equality. Um, the principle of equal treatment may potentially undermined by both discrimination towards enhanced and non-enhanced persons. Given the relatively limited effectiveness and limited popularity of the existing human enhancement technologies, these may still be more of a future challenge, but first claims of this type, for instance, of the workplace environment, cannot be excluded in the near future. It could be for example whether being an enhanced or non-enhanced could be recognized as a protected characteristic. This solution could be helpful to address the risks of uh, employees being directly or indirectly coerced to inheritance by the employers, but it also entails um, many conceptual difficulties. Establishing one's status as being enhanced might be difficult. It might be relatively less hard to, um, in some cases, especially with regard to more permanent or um, concrete types of enhancements, in cases of implants or advanced prosthetics, while in other cases it might incur very um, serious conceptual difficulties, for example, in the context of um, enhancement that has um, effects limited to a certain time, for example, some pharmaceuticals. The, uh, the Council of Europe Convention of uh, European Convention of Human Rights already contains an open and prohibition of discrimination, so this could be of help here. And reigning within the Council of Europe system, it may be comp contemplated in the future whether a prohibition of discrimination on the grounds of being enhanced or non enhanced could be added again, perhaps to the Organic Convention in a similar way as, as Convention prohibits uh, discrimination on the 
grounds of um, his or her genetic heritage.